Hi, everyone. Christian, do you want to try sharing your screen? And Michelle, do you want to um, just test out your audio really quick before we get started? Absolutely. Michelle, you're, you sound great. Lynette, do you want to test your <laughs> Thank audio you. as well? Hi, good afternoon. It's Lynette. Hi, Lynette. We can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, Christian, we can. Just look. Yep, perfect. Okay, great. I'll stop sharing just for now.
Can someone say something to make sure the audio is working? Hello. <laughs> someone is saying something to be sure the audio is working. I'm saying hello. <laughs> We're all heard loud and clear. Thank you. <laughs> Good, good afternoon, Madam Mayor. We're heading into the, the uh, appropriate time. We'll give a couple more minutes, all right, with you to sure get everybody up. Right, and I'm not going to stay on long. I'm actually in the car with a sleeping baby. Oh. <laughs> so as long as she's sleeping, I'm okay. <laughs> One would never have known, but you're not told us. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, we had a good a good turnout of pre-registration, so yeah, great. If we take a minute or two, if that's all right with your schedule, we'll yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right. Just to double back on a sound check for everybody that's joined, um, we'll be going ahead here in a few minutes. Uh, and we will have a, uh, a welcome from our mayor and representative of the Corps, and then a PowerPoint presentation, and then uh, open mic to hear from all of you who have taken the time this, this evening to, uh, to listen and, and more importantly, to give us some response. I'm going to be your uh, MC and part of the presentation team. I'm Jim Murley. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for Miami-Dade County. And in a minute, Michelle Hammer from the Corps uh, uh, will be inter uh, introducing herself. I was trying to get us to half the participants, Mayor, but we're climbing. Right. I'm gonna go uh, directly to you. We've got a few uh, housekeeping uh, slides uh, that were, would come in order, but uh, when I cue you in, Christian, let's go to the welcome from the mayor. Do you uh, wanna do the housekeeping first? 
Jim, and well, then I'll that, do my. We can do that. It's just the uh, agenda. That's okay. Okay. All right. We'll we'll do it. Let's get to one fifty and and power up. All righty, I think we're at that golden moment. Uh, once again, on behalf of Miami-Dade County, um, any participating agencies at the county level, regional level, involved citizens, and our partners uh, throughout the U.S. Corps of Engineers, uh, our key partners at the Norfolk District, but also Jacksonville District and uh, headquarters in Washington, um, a lot has happened since we last chatted with you and shared information with you in November, and that's the reason for this, this update. And uh, I think we can advance. So um, we'll have a welcome in, uh, in a minute from our, our mayor. Um, we'll be uh, setting the context for the related resilience initiatives in the county of which we see this initiative around protecting our community from storm surge as one element in a larger plan uh, that we need to do with our all of our uh, municipalities and other partners uh, to protect our community from uh, a, a series of uh, climate events and flooding events. Uh, we'll talk about how we got here, uh, a summary of community engagement from the last time um, we met in November at a five-day um, charrette. I will talk about some draft alternatives which are being offered tonight to engage you and listen again uh, for your comments and in, uh, so we, we can make changes and, and update uh, these alternatives. They're, here, they're offered to help the discussion. Uh, talk about the process moving forward, next steps, questions and answers. This is the bulk of the time. Uh, questions and answers. There is no closed time for the end of this session. It's when everybody had, has one chance at, uh, to talk, and if there's any repeats, we'll get them. Uh, so, um, the Zoom rules. Uh, and by the way, we're, we are being recorded. I think you should have heard that as you joined. Um, but please remain muted throughout the presentation in the Q&A. Unless you're called on, please enter all questions or comments in the chat box. The moderators will be monitoring the chat and reading the questions out loud. This is, this is going to be instantaneous. They're, uh, they're going to be real time with your chat uh, comments. We don't get to your question during the meeting. We'll answer it in the Q&A document that we've mailed out to all participants. and will be posted on the project website. Uh, with that, let me welcome uh, Miami-Dade County's Mayor uh, Daniela Levine Cava. Uh, a leader in this effort, among many others, and we're happy that she could join us this, this evening. Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, Jim. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We so appreciate your participation in this critical endeavor, and it is truly a unique process we're undertaking, and so I truly appreciate the collaboration that has been exemplified by Assistant Secretary Connor, 
and the entire US Army Corps of Engineers team. So before we get to the presentation, I would like to remind everyone that in addition to this study, my administration is taking actions across the county in collaboration with other leaders, cities, and all stakeholders to both mitigate and adapt to climate change. So this is part of a larger puzzle, if you will. Our newly expanded Office of Resilience, along with leaders from every county department, uh, is actively monitoring, uh, excuse me, actively implementing a variety of plans and supporting strategies to build equitable resilience solutions to issues like flooding, sea level rise, and extreme heat throughout our diverse community. And as we hear your important questions, your concerns and ideas for solutions, I know that we will do everything we can to address them through this initiative, but also through others that might be a better fit with the particular ideas or suggestions. So it's an, a very comprehensive resilience and environmental program underway uh, with the county and in partnership with our 34 cities. So your voice and your input are valued for this and for all of those initiatives. We're uh, navigating this newly restarted planning process with the US Army Corps of Engineers, and it's critical that county governments, all our cities and our residents are united and that we're committed to seeking the best possible solution for dangerous storm surge that threatens our county every hurricane season this year and into the future. And that is why we are engaged in this process. And so the new round with the core is building on the original study that was put on hold in 2021. It was driven by this community's collective response, understanding that the first round was really not uh, something that our community could support. So um, although we were unable to build a consensus at that time, we are bringing forward new ideas, new circumstances, new cities to partner with us, all to build a safer future ready Miami-Dade. Progress in the first year of the restart must include different options than those that failed the first time. By August of this year, we hope to be in a position to have enough agreement to proceed with a deeper and more refined plan that will still require will still require con continued community engagement. So it, it will not be over by any means in August, but we do want to have the broad outline of a plan by then. Uh, so we're revising options so we'll be better prepared for the subsequent three-year feasibility study. And by the way, that study will be entirely funded by the federal government. In the first iteration of the process where we were working closely with a specific set of communities that would have been the most affected or impacted along the back bay and since that plan wasn't going to work my administration has recognized the need for other options that we can present to the entire county a broader set of stakeholders so as we neared the restart the timing coincided with the core's new appreciation for nature-based features and that was, of course, one of our key concerns and the willingness of the core to tailor solutions to a community's specific needs. The core was previously required to use a predefined process, which was not appropriate for communities as large, complex and vulnerable as ours. So thankfully, we've had a chance to restart and explore options that may better fit our needs and preferences. So over the next four years, the Assistant Secretary, Connor, and I will thoroughly review all plans before anything is advanced to the more detailed design phase uh, for our future in Miami-Dade. And nothing will be forced upon our municipalities and our residents. Moving this process forward hinges on buy-in from our entire county. I truly appreciate the Corps' flexibility in working with me and my administration to better address the unique issues that face us. And I am also grateful to be collaborating with all of our cities in good faith to protect our, our community against dangerous storm surge, to implement complementary resilience strategies, and to meet the needs of our residents. Our Office of Resilience staff will go into more detail about the process and uh, proposed alternatives and their impact on our community. So thank you again for joining us today. And I look forward to a productive discussion followed by a charrette process in the beginning of March, which will also be described. Thanks so much, Jim. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
um, and we hope um, you're traveling safe and we are, will uh, look forward to your involvement at the beginning of the Shred next week. Let me uh, introduce our partner uh, and led by a, a very broad uh, Corps of Engineers team that she'll talk about. I want to reiterate the thanks that the mayor mentioned uh, for the flexibility uh, that the Corps has, has demonstrated in response to the county and the many comments they received. So uh, Michelle Hammer from the US Corps of Engineers, would you like to say a few welcoming remarks? Sure, thank you, Jim. I I greatly appreciate the remarks by Mayor Kava. Absolutely, this is a very complex area and we can do the best engineering, but it really takes the ground truthing from the public uh, to help make that a reality. So really appreciate this opportunity to get the comments, to get the feedback and to help us uh, refine the alternatives as we move forward to something that can be implemented in Miami-Dade County. Thank you, Michelle. Um, we'll now get into the program update uh, and uh, to uh, introduce, as the mayor mentioned, um, our efforts around uh, the opportunity to work with the Corps uh, to evaluate measures to protect us from storm surge is just one part of a much broader array of programs uh, that uh, are conducted in the Office of Resilience by the county. And let me say that you can often find a counterpart office, or in some cases an individual, in uh, one or more of our 34 cities, or in the water management district has an office of resilience. And there's a state chief resilience officer, Dr. Wes Brooks. So we are all working together on this, but the county's office under the mayor's leadership uh, has a broad scope of responsibilities that are represented here on this slide. I'm not gonna go into all of them because uh, each one of them could give you, a, we could do a slideshow, but it's to be sure you understand that we are, we never address a single issue uh, without understanding how the mitigation and adaptation process of look, dealing with climate change um, is, is going to work one, uh, in, in a certain process. A particular focus on Biscayne Bay, where we have our chief uh, bay officer, Arella Begay, and extreme heat, where we have a chief heat officer, Jane Gilbert, and a future ready process where we're trying to really combine our planning efforts going on throughout our community uh, led by Kim Brown. So we have a broad scope. Uh, we, do the, we do a lot of the uh, thinking about the future, but a lot of the heavy lifting is done by our 29 plus departments. And without naming them all, I just wanna give them the credit for the real work that goes on in implementing ordinances, developing projects, uh, working as one team for Miami-Dade County uh, with our partners. So we have a, a array of plans that um, specifically talk about how to deal with the flooding issues and sea level rise and the change in our, our environment due to climate change in the future. Our overarching plan is our resilience strategy, which we did under the auspices of the uh, 100 Resilient Cities Program, the Rockefeller Foundation. We did it in collaboration with the city of Miami and the city of Miami Beach, but today in its implementation, it includes all 34 cities and many not-for-profit and private organizations. Uh, th that is our overarching plan. Uh, one of our key partners is the Miami Foundation and they maintain the uh, website, which you can see at resilient305.com. At the county level, we have uh, strategies that we uh, then develop to be consistent with the 305 resilience strategy, but going into much greater detail. And you'll see there are three of the main ones. Uh, I would want I would be remiss of not to mention that another key strategy is the outcome of the Biscayne Bay uh, Task Force report, which drives the work that Arella does uh, now with the Miami-Dade County uh, Biscayne Bay Watershed Management Board uh, and the Biscayne Bay Commission. We, we'll have a whole other presentation on Biscayne Bay for you in the future. Uh, and we're dealing with a climate action strategy, reducing greenhouse gases and extreme heat. But focusing on our overall strategy for sea level rise, which is where we focus the sea level rise is the, you know, is the stress that makes the impact of a shock like, like a, a, a hurricane storm surge wave. That's where we have to put all the pieces together. 
So we in that strategy, which um, is on all of this is online at miamidade.gov slash resilience. Uh, but you'll see that we have some guiding principles that we hope you'll see reflected in the issues that we would deal with if it were sea level rise, storm surge, uh, or any of the flooding issues that we talk about. And, and if you'll see that document online, you'll see that the shocks and stresses and other issues that we address are fairly broad in terms of the work that goes on in the county. We have five adaptation approaches that some of which I think, again, you'll see reflected in the way we think about how we go forward with, with addressing storm surge, especially elevating uh, houses and finding ways for the water in the future to be absorbed in our community because with sea level rise and, the, and, the, and it's an impact on groundwater every time we have a rain event or a, or a high tide. Uh, we're going to have more flooding and we're going to have to deal with, with the water in the future. So we, we go into detail in all five of these approaches and we welcome your uh, addressing those uh, and in the future getting back with us. Uh, one of the things that really is important as we um, uh, think about this restarting this project that takes a look at storm surge. We really have, uh, we're at a key juncture. We have more core related, core supported studies going on in the county than perhaps any county in, anywhere in the United States. Some of them were in place when we started three or four years ago, but many have come online since. So we have made a major objective of this work in restarting this, this focus on the back bay to be closely coordinated with the other projects that are being uh, led by uh, Jacksonville or or uh, Norfolk districts and all the other uh, support structures within the core. You can see some of them mentioned here are, uh, you can see all the acronyms. You don't have uh, to file if you don't want to. Well, you can start playing around with uh, okay, can we get there? You go. Um, so I just want to mention that our 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 recent study that was led by the North, uh, Jacksonville District, coordinated by our Division of Environmental Resource Management, uh, Durham here at, at the county, uh, for the beach uh, study was reauthorized in 2022. That's a major major goal. That beach profile is a, has many benefits to the community, but one of which is to protect us in part from storm surge. And that is, uh, so we have that in place now, we can build on that. We have work that we've done in Key Biscayne. They're awaiting a decision on uh, some additional funding, to hopefully at the end of this month. So we have our fingers crossed for uh, our uh, partners at the village of Key Biscayne, who will be doing uh, work that we talk about tonight, but really focused on their unique position on the island. We have a major study going on uh, led by the core Jacksonville district and the uh, South Florida Water Management District to look at the canal system, the big canals and how they they played such a role uh, in the way we've developed over the last 50 years. But they're not designed to work in the next 50 years. They did not design them to deal with sea level rise and some of the flooding that we are now experiencing. So we have taken on a major assessment of those studies, and that's led by our partners uh, at the South Florida Water Management District. And of course, uh, underlying everything is the importance of uh, continuing to implement the Everglades Restoration Program. Uh, we have a, a complete set of pro projects being studied under the Biscayne Bay uh, Southeast Everglades Restoration BC uh, project. I'm not going to go into all these, but they are uh, very important. Uh, they are they are going to be uh, looked at in every step of our process of evaluating the right path forward for addressing storm surge. As we will also look at county and municipal resilient stormwater master plans. Our partners in the cities have done some great work. They have uh, they have led their their work has led to their communities passing uh, general obligation bond issues, taxing themselves to make the improvements. Uh, we have a Biscayne Bay Reasonable Assurance Plan underway under the auspices of our Chief Bay Officer and many others. That's the water quality element that we'll, we won't talk about as much tonight, but is equally important to thinking about how we deal with the volume of water. 
So this slide is filled with information. Uh, it talks about uh, the different uh, aspects of our profile um, of our community from offshore with our most valuable coral reefs all the way to the Everglades. So we'll, we'll have this. We can, uh, you you're, should feel free to ask us how to get more information on any of the things that are mentioned in that. Okay, next slide, please. I think it's time for me to handle this over to my partner, Michelle Hammer. Michelle. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that, uh, handing that over. And I forgot to mention earlier, I am chief of the planning and policy branch at the Norfolk District, and we are happy to partner with Jacksonville. Uh, we have been partnering with Jacksonville since the original feasibility started in 2018, and we're happy to continue uh, partnering with Miami-Dade County as we move into this part, part one of two parts of this additional time and funding as we, in this unique, uh, evaluation that we're going through. So as we are looking at the alternatives moving forward, certainly we are not uh, by ourselves. We are uh, gaining a lot of um, support uh, from our North Atlantic Division, which is our chain of command, certainly, and then also from uh, South Atlantic Division, which houses Jacksonville. So there are a lot of partners on board that are helping us evaluate these alternatives, especially those that uh, may influence or fall within study areas of those other studies that Jim mentioned. So their, their input is very important on how we move forward to formulate the alternatives uh, in the upcoming days. In addition, engineering with nature, that is the core of engineers uh, experts in natural and nature-based features. And so we've uh, asked them to participate. They participated in the November charrette and they will participate again in the March charrette, helping us uh, start to um, design and formulate and, and identify where those natural nature-based features uh, can be can be uh, located, certainly need the input from the public because certain things we'll have to talk about is certainly size, what's required. As we look uh, from the core perspective, the authority for the study is really coastal storm mismanagement. And that is um, at a level looking at reducing damage, right? So we're looking at reducing damage to structures. Now, in addition to uh, damage reduction, there are some comprehensive benefits such as environmental quality, and we wanna look at other uh, social effects as well. But the primary driver that the Corps of Engineers looks at is uh, what damage can we reduce from coastal storm surge? So when we look at uh, formulating natural nature-based features, where can we uh, locate them to where that helps reduce that wave inundation uh, and the surface water, water surface elevations in those areas? Also, uh, we'll be looking at non-structural, something we evaluated in the uh, first part of the feasibility study, the original feasibility study. Uh, we'll be looking at non-structural. So we really need the experts from the National Non-Structural Committee helping us uh, formulate where those measures can take place. And then uh, within our chain of Chain of Command is the Planning Center of Expertise for Coastal Storm Risk Management. So they help provide input, uh, things to consider, and then also certainly about the models that we use to identify those economic benefits. And then Engineering Research and Development Center, they provide great uh, expertise in terms of, again, coastal storm risk measures and how we can uh, identify, again, also benefits and how those uh, measures fall within the landscape. So. Definitely not just the Norfolk District. We have a lot of experts that are participating in the study to help us uh, formulate um, this alternative moving forward. So this is just a little graphic of where we are. Now we had the original feasibility study and that will, that began in 2018 with the signing of a feasibility cost share agreement. It, that is something in general, feasibility studies are cost shared 50-50, but because of the emergency supplemental, this was 100% and still is 100% federally funded. So the original feasibility study was funded for $3 million federal funding. And then right now um, we have up to $8.2 million in this um, in this uh, uh, portion of the feasibility study. We uh, published a draft report in June of 2020, and then we were working towards a recommended plan in 2021, working towards that final report. But as Mayor Kava mentioned earlier, as we were uh, 
working through our agency technical review, uh, Miami-Dade County taking in certainly the public response to our recommended plan and, and the tentatively selected plan that was identified in the draft report, uh, it made that difficult decision that uh, they could not support uh, the plan. And we'll talk about that. It wasn't a complete, they couldn't support everything in it. There were some features that we will move forward, uh, we'll evaluate moving forward, uh, but understanding the, the citizen response to the structural measures that were included. So we are in this uh, part one of the additional time and funding. There is a go, no go in August, and that's a meeting with our assistant secretary of the Army for Civil Works. Um, he provided the uh, approval for the additional time and money. So we have a requirement to brief him in one year. We were given the approval in August of 2022. So our briefing will be in August of this August 2023. And the briefing is to uh, update our time and funding uh, estimate, our scope and schedule to what will get us to a uh, signed chief's report, which was our final document that we were working towards in the original feasibility study. Uh, based on the information that we've gathered and the alternatives that we have formulated or proposed to include in the next step, you know, how much time and money will we need to get to a recommended plan and also achieve environmental compliance. That's something that we did not achieve in the original feasibility study. So all of those factors, all of that um, input from the environmental resource agencies will be very important in helping us understand the path forward or how we get that uh, permitted and built uh, if we are able to recommend that in the future. So the August 2023 uh, go no go meeting will be the whether we move forward into the next phase or not. So we're, we're working towards that schedule. If we are given approval, then we will restart the feasibility study clock with the updated scope and schedule, and we will republish a draft report, and then we will work towards a chief's report. I will uh, reiterate what Mayor Kava mentioned. There'll be multiple opportunities to provide additional comment in that uh, part two. So we will definitely provide an updated schedule and those opportunities to provide comment uh, as we move forward. Next slide. So this is kind of just a little, uh, hopefully, easy to read roadmap. We are really trying to identify the different pieces. Uh, we really started in November with the charrette, getting all the great input from the different uh, perspectives. And then we are holding certainly the public meeting today. Uh, we were um, working on the screening criteria uh, in between uh, November and working on that in January and in February. Um, in March next week, we will have the next charrette will help us refine the alternatives and identify hopefully pockets of areas like natural and nature based features and certainly any additional things that we should be considering. Uh, that will be important at that time. Then we'll go into uh, the engineering analysis and economic analysis. At the end of the day, we have to identify plans that can be economically justified and engineeringly feasible and certainly environmentally acceptable. And those will, that will be the analysis that we will do following the charrette in March. In spring, we are planning to do another public meeting. Certainly, uh, as we go through that alternative evaluation, we'll be able to provide some results in the spring. And then in preparation for the August meeting with the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, we're going to have kind of a touch point meeting in May, towards the end of May, which uh, brings together the scope and schedule that we have uh, developed in partnership with the resource agencies and our partner, Miami-Dade County and um, we'll present that draft schedule and the alternatives at that time. Certainly that's an opportunity to provide feedback. We'll take that feedback back and update the, you know, update the documents as necessary. Uh, plan to have a meeting, uh, public meeting in June so we can provide those results. And then all of this is leading up to that August uh, 23 go no go meeting. And as mentioned, there'll be at those public meetings, there'll be opportunities to provide additional comments. And then we'll talk later uh, about the opportunity to provide comments on the public comment tool. Uh, it provides an opportunity to provide places and uh, uh, your comment associated with that place. Okay, so this is, um, kind of a recreation of the August uh, 21 uh, recommended plan at that time. 
Uh, that recommended plan included structural measures, storm surge barriers with associated flood walls and pump stations and tide gates at Biscayne Canal, Little River, Miami River, Coral Gables Waterway, and Snapper Creek Canal. Non-structural measures similar to what we'll be evaluating moving forward, uh, evaluate, uh, excuse me, elevating 5,800 structures and flood proofing 4,600 structures. In addition to that non-structural um, in those non-structural measures, we were evaluating and including a critical infrastructure, dry flood proofing of critical infrastructure. And then also we included a natural nature-based feature, uh, mangrove and coastal wetland restoration in Cutler Bay. And as I mentioned before, that uh, there were certainly concerns with structural measures along the canals in the village of Miami Shores and the city of Miami. Um, but there were some features that did have, uh, you know, the agreement with Miami-Dade County, and those were the non-structural measures and the natural and nature-based features. So uh, those will move forward into the alternatives that you'll see in a moment, and there'll be uh, opportunities to provide additional locations for natural nature-based features um, and uh, where we can, you know, expand beyond Cutler Bay. So breaking up this uh, part one of the part of the two part feasibility study in part one, we had uh, from October uh, to January, we were we conducted the November charrette and we have been engaging virtually and in person. We had an in-person meeting uh, during that week, that November charrette week, and then certainly public meetings to gain input. We also have that online public comment tool. Uh, from that charrette moving into developing and refining the alternatives and we'll, we'll talk about that moment, in a moment. And this is a public crowdsourcing map tool. The tool is available at that link on there and these uh, slides I believe will be available uh, on the project website uh, in the next couple of days. Um, you're able to identify a point on the map and then uh, provide your comment uh, once you click on the map. And that's a great place uh, to identify where there are issues, where there are flooding issues, where there are concerns. Um, if you have recommendations of where you'd like to see a natural nature-based feature, please feel free to put that comment on the map. Um, something we can look at as we move into the charrette next week and then also certainly beyond that charrette and move into the evaluation. So the November, November charrette was a very busy week, but it was a great week of coming together with the different subject matter experts. It was really um, energizing to hear all the great uh, information and perspectives coming together. Um, certainly included our engineering with nature, uh, localities within Miami-Dade County, stakeholders and different perspectives. It really was, um, I think Jim, is that, Correct me, at one point we had 80 participants in the in the charrette. I, I think that's right, Michelle. And uh, and then uh, we had people that would meet us as we did our bus tours, yep. It was really great to hear the feedback and, and all those different perspectives. And uh, that was really just a wealth of knowledge. So really great to, to see all that in one room. Um, it started out, we started, had the public meeting that night. We started with the introduction, talking about problems and opportunities and how we were trying to frame the week. Uh, the week started in, uh, again, with that opening. Uh, I believe the next day was in Miami. Um, and then uh, moving through the week, we looked at Miami Shores and then also Coral Gables. I'm sorry, Cutler Bay and Coral Gables. So during the week, we did have uh, working at tabletop sessions. We had maps of the uh, project area and the different tables were able to draw on the maps to identify uh, recommended uh, features to include in the alternative. And then also um, it was opportunity to sketch out priorities. Each of the tables uh, talked about things that were important to them and things we'd like to avoid. Uh, we'll talk about that later. There were definitely um, repetitive uh, themes that came up such as um, multiple layers of defense and natural nature-based features where those could be implemented. Mm -hmm. 
definitely those takeaway themes, the system-wide approach uh, for coastal storm risk management, the multiple layers of defense and looking at adaptate uh, adaptive solutions. So we think about what the risk is today and we in the, the feasibility study process look at what the risk will be in 50 years. But sometimes what we think is going to happen in 50 years, you know, changes as we move through it. So the measures that we formulate, we want them to be adaptable so that if that assumption changes, there's the ability to adapt uh, with that changing situation. Um, one of to look at uh, solutions that were equitable, equitable and maintain community cohesion and certainly provide environmental benefits. That's one of the comprehensive benefits that we can consider, um, environmental quality. Um, and then one of the things that was uh, identified, uh, trying to certainly convey the information to the public, it would be helpful if we were able to develop some rent Did we lose her? Yeah, I can't hear her. I can't hear her anymore. Yeah, uh, I think we lost Michelle. If somebody with Michelle can. We can see the screen being shared. And the mouse moving. If, if that's... Um, yeah, Abby or Roz, can you let Michelle know we're, we've lost her audio? Maybe we lost her. Everything else seems to be intact. No, her, her video is frozen also. Video and audio are out. Who's sharing the slide? I think Those that's 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 us. Okay, that's that's still working. Hey, Jim, this is Joe Vitri. I'm trying to get a hold of her via text. I just got an unmute. I should, I don't know if I, I wasn't muted, but <laughs> maybe that happened to her too. Michelle, can you hear us? Hey, Jim, can you hear me? This is Joe Vitri. Yeah, Joe, we can hear you strong. Okay, let me, uh, I'm trying to text her. Give me a second. Right. There, so Talk it's not the whole lost. network. It's, yeah, yeah, it's just probably the local. district. Right. Yep, yep, let me try. Thanks. Right. We're going to get back to this because the next couple of slides are some really good um, summaries of what the tables did during the November charrette, which we listened to, we reviewed, and that had a lot to do with uh, from the county's perspective in, in bringing forth the uh, two options uh, that you'll hear about, you probably may have read about in uh, when the newspaper article came out. So I hate for so many people who have given us your time. I, uh, Lynette, are you there? Hey, um Jim, Jim, yeah. this is Joe Vitri. I got a hold of Michelle. She's struggling trying to get back in. I think she's going to use a hard line and try and call in via phone. Give her a second. Okay, we're going to do that. Thank, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Glad to have you on, Joe. See, looking thank forward you. to seeing you at the charrette. And hi, Jim. This is Lynette. I'll just stand by. Yeah, I thought you and I could maybe take a couple slides. We'll see if we if they can. Uh, well, we can talk yeah, about the might, charrette current. Well, it might be a good idea. We're good. We're good, Arella. Let's, we let's got talk it. about the takeaways yeah. in the, from the charrettes. We were all there. Well, that's what we're going to. We're just giving them an opportunity to see if they can connect. Okay. 
I think what we'll do, Lynette, is go ahead and take uh, move into the slides and do our best to uh, present. I don't think we'll have anybody but Joe that seems to be able to connect from the core. So, sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, folks, uh, the next. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got the dogs. Uh, you know, we're, we we had some takeaway themes here that we've laid, listed uh, that were key to, you know, the five days of working together. Um, it needs to be a system-wide approach to dealing with coastal zone risk management, layers of protection. And that's really important, the multiple layers of protection. It's just not one measure that's probably going to solve this, especially when you take in consideration that there are compound flooding issues that are not the, the uh, focus of a, of a, of a uh, storm surge model, but we have to think about because those are gonna be events that will occur with a hurricane. So we have to keep all that in mind. We develop solutions that address social equity and maintain community in cohesion. Cohesion, I think you'll hear more about that as we talk about the two options. Uh, we hope that we're, demonstrating the importance of community engagement throughout the process. Uh, and, and it's not just words or talk, it's also pictures and things that people can respond to and draw on and uh, uh, say, yeah, your name. And residual risk, I wanna turn that residual risk uh, item over to Lynette. That's kind of a, a technical term, but it's important. Can you expand on that a minute, Lynette? Sure can. The, the best way to describe it is every single, every type of alternative covers a certain type of risk or a certain amount of risk. And just throwing out, you know, let's say, you know, if you had a scale of zero to five, just, just using this as broad numbers and a measure were to go up to four, that would tell you that there's 20% left. So that, that from four to five, you still have to look at 20% risk that is still out there and one needs to deal with. So when you have this concept of residual risk and asking folks, you know, when in that conversation of what's acceptable to stakeholders, it's really the trade-off of would you like to have something that is a higher wall that was earlier on than our folks, you know, clearly the community said no versus different types of options and being able to evaluate what are the trade-offs within those acceptable solutions and dealing with what's left over. So that, that risk profile of what's left over is what gets termed residual risk. Over. Thanks, Lynette. And I think um, the other next two bullets uh, repeat some of the things we've been talking about. Uh, and let's go on to the next slide. So uh, we had a whole bunch of uh, hybrid solutions, uh, such as living with shorelines in conjunction with lower uh, hall, uh, wall heights. Uh, the layers of defense is, a, is, I think, the same concept we mentioned here as multiple lines of defense. We can't just depend on one, uh, you know, simple or not so simple, but one uh, single in investment and think that that's going to save us from storm surge when it's together coupled with uh, also compound, compound flooding. We're talking about a 100-year storm instead of a 200-year storm in some of the models. Uh, we can talk about, we heard about the uh, seawall and public walks on Miami shores, levees in the north area of Miami, uh, co-locating coastal storm risk management measures with the existing and, up, and planned upgrade structures that are on the primary canals uh, maintained by the water management district. Cutler Bay opportunity to look at even uh, more than we had proposed in the original plan, but using old Cutler Road as a feature and a phase approach to construction and improved communication. Uh, the bin wall concept, I think you'll hear more about that. Uh, well, let me stop a minute. Lynette, you want to explain bin wall and that real quickly is a new term that wasn't in the as much discussed in the uh, original plan. Yeah, I think actually I'm going to ask Justine because I see Justine's on the line and Justine has done a fantastic job at describing this concept and I don't want to misstate since I, uh, I, do know what it is, but the way she rolls it out is so much more user friendly. May I ask you, Justine, to step in here? Can we get her on? She's, yep, she's here. Go right ahead. Hi, thank you, Lynette. Um, I will start and I will also um, 
I believe we do have our engineering team on the call as well to, to address that comment. Um, so I think uh, the bin wall concept allows uh, potentially for some additional uh, recreational value. It is a structural type of measure. Um, I'll go ahead and pause there and see if Drew or Robin are on the line and would like to add to that. Hey, hey Justine, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hey, I'm here. Okay, I, all right, I, okay, I was great. thinking that might come up. So, so yes, uh, Drew Gabler here. So, so really the bin wall idea, um, really it developed out of the need. It, it mostly comes from kind of underground needs, but it has above ground benefits. So, you know, typically when we do, we do a, a, a structure like this, the piles underground have to be battered uh, towards, and when we are dealing with uh, existing seawalls, existing structures, uh, a bin wall allows to avoid the back batter of a pile uh, if you don't know all of the foundation information from the structures behind. But the secondary benefit there is also that it's very convenient to have a maintenance or a walking trail that can be used with the combined recreational benefits. So that's the biggest difference between a traditional seawall and what we're calling a bin wall. Over. Thanks, Christine and Drew and Lynette. I believe that we've got a connection back for Michelle, I hope. Hi, Jim. Yes, I'm back online. I had to use my phone. Um, I'm still working out technical issues <laughs> for the computer, but at least I'm here. Now. Well, you just say you just tell uh, uh, Christian to advance and uh, we'll hand it hand the mic back to you. Sounds good. And I think uh, you have covered this slide perfectly. Yes. I think we could go ahead and move to the next slide. So different perspectives, certainly, again, we're talking about that those multiple lines of defense, um, but the idea here was to uh, include recreation and retention, the ability to absorb um, uh, storm surge, but also maybe uh, precipitation. And so that idea of having that first line of defense for the natural nature-based features, and then behind that uh, feature would also be maybe raised levees, um, and, and if there's an opportunity to, we talked about co-locating um, uses uh, for features, right? Instead of it just being a wall that you need when a storm surge is coming, when you're having a hurricane come your way, maybe there could be other opportunities to use that space. Maybe it could be a recreational space, such as a levee. It could be an amphitheater that you is used, a grassy area where you could sit but you know, when a storm is coming, it would be a levee system or a, a barrier system. And then certainly um, the importance again of talking about residual risk, when you are weighing out the different features and the priorities for the area, if you talk about a lower wall, then you have higher residual risk, really want to talk about um, you know, making sure that that's acceptable. We talk about if you design and implement a system today that has residual risk, those who are here today may accept that uh, residual risk, but certainly people who move into the area later may not understand the, you know, the acceptance of that risk. So it's something that should be discussed not only today, but into the future as, uh, as designs are made and then they're being rolled out for the public. And then again, we talked about a uh, need for better graphics and models and animations just so that we can better convey the message uh, to the public. Next slide. Again, there was this, uh, again, talking about natural nature-based features. Uh, there was a discussion about floating spoil barriers, uh, islands, uh, maybe to re-nourish the islands, the barriers uh, within Biscayne Bay. And then um, natural nature-based features, again, talking about green spaces, the opportunity to be used for other things. Um, instead of uh, the barriers that were identified in Miami Shores, maybe there could be the, um, a, a park that was a levee and then could be used again for open space and green space uh, instead of, again, the barriers that were identified on the canals. And then the, um, the, idea, uh, the idea of allowing room for storage of water when it comes from precipitation and then also absorbing for storm surge. Next slide. This, as you see, this uh, theme of multiple lines defense uh, really runs through the different tables, even though we were separated 
in our uh, groups, uh, certainly there were common themes that continued to, um, to kind of weave through the different groups, uh, looking at preserving community and, and finding balance um, solutions for areas that were most highly impacted. Really, when we talk about uh, looking at reducing damage, we do kind of focus in on those areas that have um, the highest damage, but we have to kind of blend that in with the community. And then uh, again, referring back to renderings, uh, visualization of the plan that we, we are working to refine. And then the idea of uh, the phased implementation, um, maybe not everything is, maybe there's an opportunity to phase different features. Um, certainly that's an economic challenge uh, or an exercise and we have to work through that. But um, the reality is that as a project is authorized and moves into design and construction, there are features uh, that can get constructed before others. So it's it's a reality more so than just, uh, certainly not everything would be constructed at one time. And we could look at how we prioritize uh, those implementations so that uh, we are targeting priority areas and then can work through the entire alternative. Next slide. So in the five-star plan, again, talking about multiple lines of defense, um, elevate communications and, and looking at opportunities to blend in the, the features into the landscape. There are uh, areas uh, in Virginia, such as where the, um, the measure kind of blends into the landscape. We have a, a boardwalk that is a, um, is a seawall in Virginia Beach and it's, uh, there's, a, there's a beach that goes in front of it, but the two features work together to provide risk reduction for the city of Virginia Beach. So there's opportunities to blend the features into, into the environment that already exists. Um, and then looking at, are there opportunities for hybrid infrastructure such as low, uh, low hanging fruit? Certainly want to um, focus on critical infrastructure. That's where you get a big bang for your buck in terms of community resilience, uh, having your, uh, critical infrastructure come back online more quickly. It certainly helps the community uh, respond more uh, quickly. And then um, opportunity to uh, water quality improvement. That's not generally something the core focuses on, but certainly in conjunction with uh, environmental quality, that's something that could be considered uh, in, uh, a comprehensive benefit. And moving on to the next one, uh, again, looking at uh, multiple lines of defense, uh, talking about dunes along the barrier islands and breakwaters uh, in Biscayne Bay, uh, looking at lowered uh, wall heights along the coast uh, instead of what was in the recommended plan, natural nature-based features in the inland areas, and then trying to balance uh, balance for coastal storm risk management. And then also uh, in those times when it's not a storm and it's not you know, serving the purpose of reducing risk, you know, how can you blend that feature again into the environment so that it becomes a, an amenity as well? Next slide. The hybrid barrier, and this was uh, kind of looking, starting to look at uh, that outer barrier uh, scenario. Um, instead of just focusing on the back bay where there are other opportunities that we could evaluate uh, to provide a broader area of protection. The, the top uh, image is a kind of a representation of a bin wall. Again, trying to um, provide opportunities uh, that would be a, an inspection path on the, on the top, but that could also be a recreational space for uh, walking or riding or riding bikes. And that might maybe might fit into the landscape uh, more easily than a, a, a wall feature. And then again, looking at, I apologize, <laughs> Christian, uh, looking at you know, barrier island improvements and the living breakwater, certainly a natural nature-based feature of, of uh, enhancing breakwaters uh, so that they become uh, a living and become more adaptable in time. And then the layered approach, we have the hybrid plan looking again, I believe this is uh, just again, multiple lines of defense, looking at natural nature-based features. Again, it's talking about spoil islands, 
Uh, this one did include uh, structural measures in Miami River, but different uh, variation of a structural measure. And then um, the opportunity to um, have inland water management areas. So as we're looking at precipitation, the opportunity to absorb that precipitation inland uh, with natural nature-based features. So the, the summary, we were looking at, again, multiple different alternatives. I would say that the November shred was really more of a discussion. Uh, there were some sketching on the maps and, and areas uh, that highlighted features that could be, or measures that could be included in alternatives, but really it was also a discussion of priorities and things that uh, were very important to the different teams talking about natural and nature-based features and multiple lines of defense and, and having the features blend into the, um, the environment uh, so that they would be useful uh, in more than just times of during the flood. So definitely um, concepts that came up um, multiple times. And again, we had the, the outer barrier feature that did uh, was presented um, in one of the tables. Apologize, I jumped ahead. So here are the themes, certainly the system-wide approach to coastal storm risk management, looking at the multiple lines of defense, uh, developing uh, the solutions that address social equity, maintain community cohesion, and provide environmental benefits. And environmental, again, environmental benefits are um, benefits we can consider under comprehensive benefits. So these are not necessarily tied to damages reduced, but provide additional uh, benefits for the alternative. And definitely in, uh, community engagement, uh, we, and the idea to provide renderings or visualization of what the alternatives look like so that we can get buy-in from the community. And that again, community uh, understanding of residual risk and why that's important to uh, continue to discuss, not only now, but uh, in the future so that uh, stakeholders and residents can understand what that means to them personally and, and can buy in on um, the alternative and the, the resulting residual risk. Uh, the hybrid solutions uh, consisting of some structural, non-structural and natural and nature-based features. And then absolutely the ongoing coordination with BBC or the, the Beach CSRM uh, study that was reauthorized and the central and southern South Florida uh, flood resiliency study. And then certainly, of course, uh, each of the communities um, are doing their own resiliency projects. So it would be important to continue to coordinate on those projects so that hopefully that those are uh, complementary uh, as we roll, roll the alternative forward. Next slide. So right now we are in the second part of the part one. <laughs> of the part one of the feasibility uh, additional time and money. And right now we are working to define and um, develop and refine the draft alternatives. And that's really the focus of the charrette uh, next week is really to uh, begin to refine the alternatives. Again, identify those areas for natural nature-based features, get that input. input. Um, as you look at natural nature-based features, not only in Biscayne Bay, but um, well, in Biscayne Bay, they'll be, uh, you know, have to um, deconflict uses. Certainly, it's a widely used bay, um, and there'll be multiple uses that we'll probably have to talk through. And how do we um, formulate and um, locate a measure without causing other uh, challenges, such as navigation and, and other uses for uh, Biscayne Bay? Thank you, Michelle. Let me. Uh... I mean, do a couple of things here. We want to be had that presentation because we want to be clear and share with you the fact that we took uh, careful notes. Uh, we it, it led and informed the work that has has proceeded since we had the charrette. We listened, and we uh, were able to look at the notes from each tabletop. I, I just want to say we weren't able to identify all the the graphic artists and thought leaders that were at those tables in that in the summary we just gave you. But we're blessed to have in Miami Data, I think some of the best experts in our, uh, our firms, our consulting firms, in our universities, in our departments and agencies 
and then our just our 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 NGOs. That's really everybody is contributing, and we need that. That's what the mayor wants. She wants a community effort to be able to report back in August, not just uh, a county or government effort. So thank you to all those participants. Uh, we as we go forward, um, we we knew as a county that we needed to to demonstrate we listened and to give a, a, a couple alternatives that um, allowed the discussion to move forward into the phases that we that have been talked about. So we also made a decision as we restarted this process that we needed further additional technical help. And we were able to bring the firm of Moffat and Nickel in to help us. Uh, they, are, they have expertise and uh, experienced work in many other communities that are doing coastal storm risk management studies. Uh, they have a local office. Um, you know, there are many good firms, but we're very happy with the work we have in the partnership with uh, Moffat and Nickel. And I'm going to ask uh, Lynette Kardosh uh, to explain the, the two uh, proposed draft alternatives uh, that evolved from listening and rereading and restudying the input we got. Uh, and importantly, uh, being cognizant of some of those new studies that had either uh, been completed and uh, adopted by the United States Congress as authorized projects or just initiate. So we had to be aware of all those as we move forward to, to provide these, uh, what we call bookends uh, of uh, discussion so that we could have this available when we had our, our, this call and also uh, at, the, uh, at the upcoming uh, charrette. So Lynette, would you please uh, go through these two options? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I just need to reiterate that the those November meetings that we had and the input that the public gave and the and some of the experts really does frame the conversation that we're having today. And I'm just gonna walk by. I love the way Jim refers to it, walk through these two options. And I love the way Jim refers to them as bookends, because that's really what they are. Is on one side, we're really talking about a non-structural alternative that I'll get into um, in more in more detail. And on the other side, it's a a different type of structural solution that um, allows us to really incorporate more nature-based features as well. So um, let's get on with the non-structural alternative. So before I get going here, let me orient you a little bit as to what we're looking at here. Um, these are flood depths that were generated by looking at the 200-year storm from the South Atlantic Coastal Study. And what that tells us is areas of, of, of some flooding and areas shallow than three feet, the darker blue is deeper than three feet. But what it doesn't really tell us is areas that we're gonna have damage. So this tells us where we know we're gonna see water in the next phase, we'd need to be able to look and to see where would there be impact to infrastructure. And the reason that matters is that there are a lot of adaptation features that one can do that include elevating and flood proofing your buildings that would, that would, that would translate into less damage. So a solution like this would not have any of the walls that were initially proposed, and it would really allow for, um, it allows, in a certain sense, it allows the water to really enter in the community, and our adaptation features, as I said, would be related to elevating and flood proofing. Now, potentially, um, there are, uh, potentially it could offer less protection than some of the other ones. But one of the things that we have in this study now for this, in this alternative that wasn't there before is in the coral color. So in that Miami Beach segment, that's the recently authorized uh, beach study that um, Jim mentioned earlier, and that's the uh, Beach Renourishment Federal Project. And when you look around at the green dots, those are just suggestions of where we may be able to continue to advance the conversation with nature-based solutions. And you'll see that in the bottom of the county, in the left-hand side, that green line, that's still the Cutler Bay wetlands. So we have not, um, we've not changed that particular feature down there. Those nature-based features would stay and we'd continue to advance the conversation with additional parts, um, zooming into the northern part of the bay, adding features around um, that, that, that would uh, um, potentially reduce some of the, uh, the wave energy as well. Um, one thing to note is uh, Monroe County, our county to the south has recently um, had their plan authorized and they are in this non-structural alternative. So next slide. 
These are some of the examples. You can start to look at elevating and flood proofing. And this is kind of what it looks like when you're elevating your home. You can see that there are both examples of in progress and complete and the complete examples. And so it's, it's not for the, um, it's, it's not, uh, it's not without some effort that we need to do these things, but you can see that once you're reached the end result in these particular examples, you can still have quite an attractive community, which is oftentimes one of the main concerns that we have is that community cohesion and harmonization in the community. And on the right, you could see the flood proofing of commercial properties and having these removable flood barriers. So again, those would be things that you would need to do um, when the storm's coming in, go ahead and start to uh, put your flood barriers in place and have that individual site-specific um, site um, protection. So next slide. Okay, so I'll spend a little more time on the proposed Atlantic coastline alternative. And let me, uh, let me orient again the, the slide. The slide on the, the picture on the left is the full um, the full county study area. You'll see that at the south, we've still got the Cutler Bay and some of the non-structural measures. So that's what you see in the hatched color is the non-structural measures. The green again corresponds to proposed or um, the proposed or, air, or areas that are already in the plan for nature-based solutions. We did not change uh, the structures that are proposed at Cutler Bay or Snapper Creek. And so as we come up into the Miami Beach Back Bay area, that's where we get into the, the larger picture there. And let me, let me go ahead and, and start to explain a little bit more on that. Um, framing the, let me, and, well, let me just go ahead and frame when we're thinking about flood risk. There really are three factors that, in, that impact that flood risk. And one is the storm surge. So again, the storm surge is that, we, that the study is, uh, intended to address. And that's really the largest part that would come in when you have the coastal flooding. The next force is waves. And finally, sea level rise. So when we started to look at the main question of how can we keep the storm surge and associated flooding off of our coastline, we started to look really towards this wonderful barrier island that we have. And the other thing that was important for us was how do we come up with a solution that does not divide the community? That was the fundamental question and challenge that we had was, we do not wanna have anything within the community that divides um, our neighborhoods. So with that in mind, we started to look at what is the, brings us the most maximum benefit? And that would be incorporating into the barrier island system and having gates that would effectively only be closed at the time of the storm. So these storm surge gates would stay open throughout, you know, really, when, all of you know year round hopefully ideally without a storm surge, without a storm coming in and so what you're seeing here is what we call the atlantic alignment is simply the barrier area simply the the boundary condition of where this would be put in so from the north coming down miami beach across uh virginia key and of course on the rickenbacker this would allow us to be able to maximize also the um the beach renourishment project and add additional dunes and have an enhanced dune system there Coming, so once you have to go from the Atlantic, you'd be able to have the gate and coming around to closing the bay off just during the storm. Um, one of the reasons that we want this study to include this type of alternative is that this really adds a, a, a lot more protection for the county. Previously, there were different focus areas. And part of our concern with that is that focusing just on those particular areas, that's not that's not really what our county is about. We are one county and we want to have something that really protects the most people, the most property and the most, you know, overall, this is the land that we've got. This type of alternative would do that. Um, the other part of it is that it doesn't, it allows for a much more equitable solution for all folks involved. Whereas some of the other alternatives, it may have less equity, a little more equity concerns, so less equal protection. One thing for, um, for us that are really looking forward to adding more additional nature-based features is once you're able to knock down that storm surge, the proposed nature-based solutions actually have um, higher viability um, to be able to withstand some of the storms that would be coming through. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there and go to the next slide. So what could this look like? So if we're coming from the right side of the slide to the left, 
if the storm would be coming from east to west, would hit this multiple layers, multiple lines of defense. We'd be able to start looking at different types of reef structures, um, artificial reefs, coral reefs, um, oysters, et cetera. Coming in at that point, you'd be having the reinforced dune system. Of course, the surge barrier gates are what would prevent that water from going into the bay to begin with. As we go at the backside of the Miami Beach, you could look at enhancing with living shorelines, mangroves, different types of vegetation. And then as you cross over, we still have some of those foil islands and could be looking at some sort of proposal that would allow us to enhance those islands and perhaps even expand on their use, creating some really, um, really good habitat as we cross the bay. As we come back towards the mainland, of course, we can continue to add features that would be submerged breakwaters that could also serve as habitat. Again, oyster reefs or any other type of reef structure that would break the wave energy. And once we get to the coastline, having something like an adapted seawall living shoreline structure. And again, we talked about the non-structural solutions. Some areas we still need to be looking at potentially elevating buildings and flood proofing as well. So keeping all of that together. Um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Lynette. Appreciate that summary. And uh, I think maybe, Michelle, you're just going to bring us home. Is that the next couple of slides? Yeah, absolutely, Jim. Thank you. So as we're looking, as we mentioned earlier, right now we are working on um, it, Right now we're working on defining uh, and refining the draft alternatives, but we also want to consider criteria to refine those alternatives. Next slide. And these alternative, the draft alternative or criteria on this slide represent uh, objectives for Miami-Dade County. These are priorities for us to consider and uh, in the different buckets for community well-being, social equity and resilience, we have and we also have economic health and natural environment, ecosystems and recreation. And some of the um, highlights are certainly um, reducing risk to human and environmental health and safety and want to look at equity, certainly low income, protecting low income uh, families and minorities, children, disabled and elderly, uh, want to promote the community cohesion in complementary land uses, are there opportunities to uh, use that measure for multiple things besides uh, coastal storm risk management? And then the ability to adapt for future conditions as we look at sea level rise into the future. For economic health, we're looking at uh, reducing that recovery time and cleanup and restoration costs. So uh, the ability for the community to quickly come back online, certainly to support uh, the community within uh, and certainly get those um, important features, those important uh, services back online uh, to support the community that helps restore the, the community moving forward. Uh, minimizing energy use and operation and maintenance costs. Um, and then certainly disruption to the regional economy, the port within the area, there's an opportunity uh, to uh, not only just the port, but also the, um, the businesses within Miami-Dade County uh, reducing risk to those businesses so they can also continue to generate income and then reducing impacts to critical infrastructure and reducing uh, impacts to transportation systems uh, which also support recovery for our community and then from the for the natural environment uh, where there are opportunities enhanced tidal wetlands and mangrove and other habitats and then improve recreational opportunities and aesthetics and uh, increase green space, uh, certainly equitably making those available to others and the natural areas and open spaces. Next slide. So just a reminder of where we are, uh, we are working towards that go, no go meeting in August of 2023 and then pending the approval by the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, we will move into the part two of the feasibility study and that will be based on the schedule and scope that we develop leading up to that August meeting. Again, we will have multiple opportunities to um, get public input. Next slide. Including the meeting tonight, and then certainly with the charrette and then uh, future public meetings, we're going to engage in wider community uh, to 
outreach and to gain feedback to refine the potential options. So again, we'll have that um, public comment tool. So please uh, feel free to um, you know, enter some comments on that tool in specific locations and provide us your feedback of what you'd like us to consider. Or again, if you have suggestions of where you would like to see natural nature-based features, um, please feel free to highlight those on that comment tool. And then through public meetings, um, certainly can get input. And then we have additional opportunities to provide feedback on this study. Our virtual public meeting certainly is tonight and we'll have the charrette uh, March 1st through the 3rd, which is next week. And then following that, we will have another uh, public meeting uh, in the spring. And then we'll have a virtual public meeting in June following um, a meeting that we'll have with the assistant secretary at the end of May, kind of bringing together the alternatives. We'll present that and they'll provide us uh, feedback and opportunities for us to refine that in preparation for our uh, no go, go, no go meeting with uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Army um, for Civil Works uh, in August of 2023. And then after that meeting, we will go back out, have another public meeting to share the results of that meeting. So I know this slide right here has a lot of to be determined. This is what we are working on developing the scope and schedule. And that's what we will implement uh, if we are able to move forward after that August meeting. And so as soon as we have the dates identified and we worked on that scope and schedule, we will, we will make that available to the public and, and publish that on our website so that it certainly provide those opportunities um, to talk about the milestones that we will be working towards and also those opportunities to provide feedback um, as we move through that portion of the feasibility study. Next slide. And there are multiple ways to provide comments. We have an email address, again, that public crowdsource reporter tool. Uh, if you prefer, you can provide written comments uh, to the address listed on the screen, and then certainly um, can provide, can call us and provide verbal comments as well. The URL for the project website is listed on the screen. And then for the charrette, it is scheduled for March 1st through the 3rd, and that will be held at Port, My uh, Port Miami. Um, and if you would like additional information, please reach out to Jim's office and they'll be happy to um, provide some more information. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you, all the people that are, we can't name. Uh, individually for the work that happened uh, to bring us to this point. Again, I'd say we are so lucky to have the expertise available uh, from the core, from the Water Management District, from a South Florida Water Management District, and from our many partners locally. Look, the challenges are significant, and we need all that uh, those resources and creativity to come up with plans that, that are the right thing for Miami-Dade County. And ultimately, you know, we will cost share with the U.S. government. The whole idea, the getting to go here is the getting something that Congress authorizes, like they did our beach project. Then implementation is cost share at 65% federal and 35% local, which that local share can come from any number of different sources. So, uh, the, the, and the, this, again, there are many other projects going on in the county. Uh, we, are, we are going to focus on making sure that we are coordinated with them and leveraging the results. Uh, we want to hear from you. I appreciate the, your patience. We all have a number of people on, and I'm sure our monitors have questions. Let's go to that phase of the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. We've been recording all of the questions. This is Sandra from the Office of Resilience, and um, I'll start reading off the questions for Jim and Michelle, and then uh, Christian and I will be uh, going back and forth. So uh, the first question we had in the chat was uh, the previous plan called for gates at some waterways. These gates would have served some, but not those people outside of the gates where flooding would increase due to the gates. Please commit to in the future offer solutions that help all, not just some. That was from Juan. Well, let me take a first shot at that. I think Lynette said it very well in describing some of the new options that uh, we wanted them to be uh, have an equitable effect across the, the landscape. And we did feel that the um, 
not intensely, but just the outcome of the way the structures were deployed along the mainland canals left, as the question um, mentioned, some people east of the, of the walls, especially up at Biscayne Canal and Little River. Uh, I don't think there's a option uh, that the county could support uh, that would have that uh, in, uh, available in the future. So uh, we learned something. Uh, we heard from people. We heard from the city of Village of Miami Shores very clearly. Uh, and I just don't see that as in our future. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, thank you, Jim. I did want to kind of revisit the original feasibility study. When we were given the opportunity to move forward, we were under, and we are still under, emergency supplemental. And so the expectation for that emergency supplemental is that we would move through the feasibility study um, and we have a policy to uh, work to complete a, a feasibility study in three years. And so just wanna kind of revisit why we were focusing on seven focus areas. We had highlighted uh, areas that received greatest damage and we're also, we union that information with socially vulnerable populations. So within that space, we did try to highlight those areas of higher risk and that was, why we had developed those seven focus areas. But uh, as Jim mentioned, um, even though when we originally started this additional time and funding, we were still focused on those additional uh, seven focus areas. We, you know, we hear the comments coming back that looking more holistically is really what the Miami-Dade County would like to pursue versus you know, certainly those seven focus areas. I'll also mention, um, the idea of those other areas were, were definitely still highlighted uh, by Jacksonville. Um, the South Atlantic Coastal Study was highlighting those additional areas that were not necessarily included in the original feasibility study. So they had identified those other areas as priority areas to investigate uh, further in the future. So even though in the original feasibility study, we had not covered those additional areas, uh, we had uh, opportunity to look at those again uh, with another study. Thanks, Michelle. It's very helpful. Thanks. And um, we have a couple of comments in the chat as well. Delaney, um, thanks so much for um, being here and for representing the youth in our county. We love your Sink or Swim project newsletter. Feel free to drop a link for that in the chat as well. Um, in case people are interested in signing up to receive that. I know we always like reading that in our office. So thanks so much for being here. And um, Delaney asks us to challenge each of us uh, to find lasting solutions, uh, not only to storm surge, but also to sea level rise. So thank you Delaney for that um, comment. And then also uh, in the comments, we also have a comment from Fulcher uh, who has so a solution for increasing seawall heights using his patented innovative precast concrete. Um, thanks so much, Fulcher, for dropping the link to um, your site there in the chat. We'll definitely check that out. And then we had a lot of people um, replying to Fulcher that um, they really support nature-based uh, solutions and green infrastructure over gray infrastructure. So we see all of your comments and we are taking all of those into account and recording all of them. And then we also have a um, comment from Rachel. It's EDF's understanding that per section 8106 of WERDA 2022, the local non-federal sponsor can request that comprehensive flood risks beyond storm surge be analyzed in the development of this authorization moving forward in the development of alternatives for the coastal storm risk management study. EDF urges that the county request this authorization moving forward to ensure that the alternatives formulated address all flood risks within the study region from Rachel. Yeah, let me address that. Rachel had raised that earlier, and, and this is a perfect example of where, you know, the, the government is not going to have even be aware of all of the different things that are going on. And uh, Rachel's group was able to bring that to our attention. We have started to investigate it. I asked our, uh, our, our consulting team to look at it. Um, I think 
and right now uh, they're still uh, trying to interpret that the impact of that section on a coastal storm risk management study that is funded under uh, disaster recovery funding. Uh, but I don't think we have an, a clear answer yet for Rachel. My approach is I like I like the section and I want to explore how we can make in, in whatever way we can make that uh, those requests in the process. So thanks again to Rachel and her group for raising that uh, provision and allowing us to ex explore it further. Um, Jeff Miller, is there anything you want to add to that? You've been my back. Is Jeff on, uh, Lynette? No, I'm here. That's that's sufficient. Good. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you again for the question. Uh, Michelle, did you want to add anything? Nope. Just taking notes, Jim. If that's something that the county would like to pursue, we'll want to make sure that we include that in the scope uh, that we present to the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works. Well, I would say pending some information we don't know, we, we want to pursue it. But uh, I think it's sort of the inside uh, deci decisions of the core, as I understand it, that we have to work through. We, we should have a, a something to report back, I'm, I'm for sure, relatively soon. Okay. Okay, thanks, Jim and, and others. This is this is Christian from the Office of Resilience. Uh, we just had a, another comment from from Juan about um, uh, just recognizing that we have high ground here in Miami-Dade County that uh, folks have historically lived on, and um, uh, mentioning the, the the strategy of of relocation to high ground as a as a way to um, reduce our risk. And I think um, we appreciate that comment, Juan. Um, we know uh, it's not necessarily part of the um, measures being considered with this study, but um, the county is, um, you know, uh, has looked at uh, voluntary buyout programs as one potential measure to reduce that risk. Um, so it's something that we continue to explore and uh, see um, how it can be uh, effectively applied here in Miami Day. So thank you, Juan, for that comment. Um, uh, looks like uh, Beatrice, um, thanks for your comment. Um, said, said you had some ideas to share with us about how to deal with um, rainfall flooding, um, uh, but yeah, we'd love to hear your ideas about that. Um, maybe it can help with our our stormwater uh, uh, management uh, options. Um, but obviously, um, rainfall, um, which comes with hurricanes, is uh, something that the, the study you know can't uh, make interior drainage uh, any worse with any of the measures that are proposed under the storm surge study. So thanks, Beatrice, for that. Please reach out to our office if you have uh, specific ideas you want to discuss with us. You can contact, contact us at resilience at Um It looks like um, we had some comments or responses from other folks in the core responding to um, Rachel. Thanks, Tim Geisen, for, for sharing those links in the chat um, to the, uh, uh, the other studies. Um, it looks like I have another comment. Um, from Joanne describing um, how the Netherlands is uh, different uh, than Miami and you might have to think about uh, uh, solutions in a different way. Thanks for, for adding that, Joanne. Um, uh, Anna has a, a question about um, who uh, may attend the charrette that's happening uh, next week, March, March 1st through 3rd. Uh, this Jim, the charrette is a public meeting. Um, we we're following the same protocols that we used in the November charrette. Uh, we have uh, a group of participants who are uh, the, the people we had asked to come in and be a part of the charrette. You have to have sort of a, a fixed number so you can uh, we can all be assigned to tables and we can deliver the work products. So uh, that participant list is a carryover primarily from the uh, November charrette. At November Charette and then the Charette coming up next week, we will always have an opportunity every day for the public to be uh, in attendance, to listen, and to make comments at a, a specific time during the Charette process. So we're going to try to, that, that's the ground rules, that's what we did, but you know we also will try to accommodate uh, public folks that are there, uh, maybe they're there for just a short period of time, 
uh, let us know and and we'll try to take make every effort to make sure you're if you have comments you they're they're uh, available to the participants. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, just recognizing uh, a few other comments uh, from from uh, Mr. Stoddard, um, understanding interest in storm surge that comes up from uh, up the bay from the south and how that can uh, affect us. We have uh, almost had that scenario um, become more of a reality with Hurricane Irma. So thanks, uh, Mr. Stoddard, for your comments and participation. Um, some more comments uh, from Juan about um, storm water entering the bay without treatment. Um, understand that's uh, one of those key uh, concerns of, of the county, and there's a lot of work um, outside of this study, um, as, as Jim mentioned, from our Biscayne Bay team and our uh, Division of Environmental Resource Management at the county to address those water quality issues. So um, tons of information online about that, and, and there'll be um, opportunities to learn more about our specific water quality issues, but certainly our goal with this study is to reduce okay. storm surge and, and, and to uh, just go in a way that doesn't harm that. Listen, yeah, let's ahead, give Jim. Arella just a chance to, uh, if she, uh, are you still honest with us, Arella? Yes, I am. You want to say just a, a little bit about all the water quality efforts that complement this work? Absolutely. <laughs> well, with relation to core projects, we're obviously working with the water management district on the 216 study that deals with their canal, the upgrades to their uh, to the regional canal system, which, as we all know, bring a lot of pollutants through that system into the bay. We are also actively involved in the Biscayne Bay BBC project, which is basically Biscayne Bay uh, restoration down south to rehydrate our wetlands and find the water, treat it, and then move it through the system, move it into um, into the wetlands to prevent saltwater intrusion. And the county is engaged in a number of water quality projects at this time, everything from stormwater um, upgrades uh, to septic to sewer conversions um, and so forth. I put in the chat and I can share it again to please track the activity of the Biscayne Bay Watershed Management Advisory Board. We meet every uh, month or so month or so, and we are actively engaged in precisely uh, dealing with nutrient pollution entering the bay and lowering those nutrient levels. Thanks, Arella. Everybody take advantage of, you know, we did not have either the water management, uh, the uh, watershed management board or the state created Biscayne Bay Commission when we went through the first three years of this. So as a demonstration of the interest, both at the state level and locally, those organizations are now in place and we make regular reports. So again, emphasizing coordinating projects and activities uh, to get the best results. All right, thanks so much, Jim and Arella for that, for that detail. Um, just noting a, a few comments um, uh, from Joanne about stormwater and the need to um, uh, restore the, the Everglades and the pre-Everglades settling ponds. And, and thanks again, Tim Geisen from the Army Corps uh, Jacksonville District. Uh, he mentioned that the, the Central and Southern Florida Flood Resiliency Study, or sometimes called a 216 study, um, accounts for sea level rise and surge effects on inland flooding, as well as rainfall intensification. So that's um, one of those key studies. Uh, I know this back bay study is, is going to be closely integrated uh, with uh, lots of coordination between um, Army Corps uh, groups, as well as uh, here at the local level and with South Florida Water Management District. So thanks so much, Tim, for that. Um, we have another question um, uh, addressed to Michelle, um, but maybe others can also answer too. Um, from Laura Reynolds, she asked, can you go into detail on what you're proposing in Cutler Bay and how it will hopefully integrate with other projects? Is it the same as before or has it been improved based on comments? So I believe we are implementing or we are recommending what was uh, identified before um, in terms of the area in Cutler Bay. Um, certainly there's opportunity to refine that as we you know, work into the charrette. If there are um, areas that we can, uh, again, evaluate additional areas or if there's uh, refinement to the area we've identified, um, 
definitely taking those comments, uh, but right now certainly would like to continue. If it's still applicable, the area that we identified before uh, would like to continue to, to push that forward uh, with the, again, with those comments from the public, we were able to, uh, one of the challenges that we have, since this is a coastal storm risk management project, we're looking at the ability of natural nature-based features to reduce the water surface elevations. And so I think Hurricane Ian was a really good example of what happens to vegetation uh, when we have um, uh, storm events like this, and, and they definitely provide a value, but articulating what that value is in terms of coastal storm risk damage, uh, we were able to uh, develop a model that helped us um, define what that uh, benefit was. And for that area, we were able to show a, a difference in water surface elevation, which equates to damage reduction. Now, of course, there are additional comprehensive benefits that can be included as well, such as um, um, environmental quality and certainly habitat. Uh, so again, considering the tweaks that we get from the public, I believe that area is still on the table. Michelle, this is Laura. I wonder if there's more detail somewhere that we can look at that model and the information that you just talked about. Is there like an FPP site that we can peruse? I will have to, um, I think we had it internally reviewed and approved, um, certainly could have a discussion about that ability. Now, absolutely, we'd have to develop uh, models for any of the natural nature-based features, we'd have to develop something similar. We'd have to look at um, the ability of those areas to reduce the water surface elevations, which then translate into that damage reduction. So, I mean, if there is additional information that you um, would like to share with us that might be helpful in interpreting that damage, we would definitely welcome that. Um, certainly, if you wouldn't mind uh, coordinating with Justine, uh, we definitely could, uh, we'd definitely like to hear what you might have. I know our, our partners over at, at Durham uh, Craig Gussenbacher and his team have been looking at some creative ideas that uh, connect to the Cutler Bay existing uh, proposals. So I'm sure that's going to come up. It came up in the last um, uh, charrette. They've done more, more work thinking about it, and I'm sure they'll share it at the charrette. No, absolutely. And I also wanted to put the plug in our engineering with nature. They provide us a lot of information in terms of um, you know how the natural nature-based features would function and how they would help reduce those water surface elevations. Okay, thanks for that. I just wanted to make sure all those good ideas at the charrette, Jim, that you mentioned, uh, I thought they were really great for the Southern end, aren't off the table, but they're still being uh, formulated or considered. Yes, we're, we're, we're in a formulation and consideration both. Go ahead, uh, Kristen, or whoever's on the. Thanks, on a... Laura. Um, yep, so we have a comment from Juan. He says gates at Gables Waterway will increase flood levels for areas east of the gates, many of which are man made and, not, and are not very high. Uh, Juan says he thinks this is the wrong solution and uh, it would be better to place the gates at the bay's entrance. Jim, you're muted if you're talking. The two structural proposals that are in the in the jurisdiction of the city of Coral Gables, um, so what, Snapper Creek and Coral Gables Canal, they, that was an interesting progression uh, in the original plan. They weren't in the temporary selective plan. They weren't in the TSP. So that public document didn't reflect them. But the modeling that the Corps did eventually demonstrated as they were looking at the entire uh, Miami River Basin that need to have some um, possible measure uh, there. And, and there we had discussions with the uh, city commission, the city manager, his folks. Uh, I, I, you know, from my view uh, that we didn't feel uh, that we should remove those without further analysis, which could include location uh, as uh, an input from the city. Of Coral Gables and everybody else. So that's why, from the county standpoint, uh, they remain in the uh, 
uh, the the option uh, dealing with the uh, Atlantic uh, shoreline, they're not in the non-structural. So, Jim, Michelle, do you want to add to that? Absolutely, that's correct. We were looking at the 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 risk of wraparound flooding, and certainly since they fall within the Miami River watershed, that there's that possibility of just flooding behind the barriers. And so we needed to cut off that flooding and that's how they were uh, added later on in the process. That'll be a point vote that we will definitely wanna get further input from the community, uh, our experts and, and the, and the uh, uh, our, our partners at Coral Gables. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Michelle. And then, um, Laura, this goes back to your previous question. I think Laura asks if we have an image that we can look at um, of how everything would fit into Cutler Bay. Laura, did those charrette um, posters help answer that question, or are you still looking for another image? Well, there were a lot of different ideas at the charrettes, and I was wondering sort of where everybody was landing based on the analysis. Uh, that you have all obviously looked at all those ideas and picked the best ones. So I'm guessing you're presenting those at the charrette. Is that correct? Well, we did the two options we presented are our attempt to bring together together some of the best ideas as we could so that we could have this discussion and in the charrette. So the things that uh, the group group feels that the charrette or otherwise need to be uh, further added to that. That's where I were still open. Got it. Okay. And if I could add, Jim, the other oh. thing too is we get into the modeling, looking at it from the engineering perspective and economic modeling, and just uh, looking at those measures. There's still that opportunity to um, tweak those areas including the feedback that we got during the charrette. So that would probably um, uh, reveal itself during, you know, after the March charrette, and then we get into the analysis uh, working towards that May meeting. And let me just say, you know, one of the reasons we want to always coordinate this single effort with the other uh, studies that are going on, is it may end up that a really good idea just doesn't fit in the, in the Back Bay project. Then the county will go to either Jacksonville or Norfolk or the water management district and say, how can we integrate this into the things you're doing? So we're, that's our mandate from the mayor uh, to take advantage of this rare time where all these projects are happening together. Thanks, Jim. And um, while we're talking about the Cutler Bay area, there's a question that asks, does the bin wall rise only when needed, say, for example, along Old Cutler Road bike path, or is this a wall along all of Old Cutler Road? I think, Michelle, that's a, that would refer to something that came up at one of the tabletops. It's not, it's not, it's, it's something we can further discuss at the, at the charrette. Now, I'm, I'm, maybe a little off uh, working here without all the, my information. Do you have something to add, Michelle or, or Lynette? Oh, sure. I'll jump in first. And then Lynette, if you want to add anything, and then I'll just ask Drew if he would like to add anything as well. So I would just mention that uh, in general, I think the bin wall is stationary. It would be the height that it is, uh, you know, permanently uh, during a storm and after a storm. Now I will mention for our Norfolk CSRM project, we are looking at opportunities to, um, there are deployable flood walls. There are pieces of the flood wall that can be put in place um, in preparation for a storm. Now we like to keep those limited because every piece of the flood wall that has to be deployed, that's certainly manpower and time that has to be um, managed prior to a storm. But there are opportunities where you have uh, maybe access ways, um, or visibility that you would like to remain open. There are um, the possibility of, again, those deployable flood walls, but the bin wall itself um, generally stays in place and, and is not uh, movable. Uh, Drew? Uh, yeah, th th that's correct. I think just to clarify as well, um, I, I don't believe the concept, any of them are calling for a bin wall down in the Cutler Bay area. 
I believe that is looking to take advantage of existing roads or bike paths and look at those as opportunities to provide elevation more inland from where you would typically find a bin wall, which is more of a replacement for what you would think of as a traditional seawall, but with the added recreational benefits of the trail and, and some of the other constructability benefits, if that makes sense. Good. Thank you, everybody, on that response. What's up? What's Thanks. next? Okay, uh, Delaney asks, as the work being covered here tonight is storm surge focused, how do you plan to solve systemic rising seas year round, not caused by a storm? What is the plan for that? Also, where is the core data that forecasts the impacts you are trying to counter with the two options being addressed tonight and who developed that data? Michelle, why don't you take the last question? Sure, absolutely. And Abby, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we uh, use the FEMA preliminary data uh, for the water surface elevations within the Miami-Dade County. So we're using available data uh, to identify the different frequency of storms. Yeah, that's correct, <laughs> Michelle, nothing to add, thank you. And, and in, in our case for our deck, desktop analyses, what we were using is the South Atlantic Comprehensive Study, which was released in August 2022. And so we were able to use the information from that to look at things like overtopping, runoff, wave heights, et cetera. And I guess that leaves me with the existential question of stopping sea level rise. Um, so I think the county understands that this is a uh, you know, an, a global issue that's been happening by global emissions. Uh, our mayor, has, as I think many of you know, has traveled uh, both now to Glasgow and to uh, Argentina to engage it, it in, and make sure that we are a player in that uh, many sector efforts, government sector, private, not-for-profit sectors. We have a plan, a climate action strategy that, that uh, addresses the emissions of our government, of Miami-Dade County, and our entire community. Uh, actually, Miami-Dade County has been tracking uh, greenhouse gas emissions for almost two decades. Um, we That plan's available online, was one of the ones I, sh I showed earlier. And um, we will have an annual update at Earth Day uh, for everyone to see. With all that said, um, we, if we were on the mitigation side, totally is, you know, we woke up tomorrow and we were all driving electric vehicles uh, powered off a grid that had some renewable energy. We're still going to have sea level rise. And that's why we have all these things uh, going on and our, and we track the, the, uh, the data. We, we need to be global citizens. We need to participate at the national and state level on mitigation. But clearly, we will be responsible for our own emissions and try to address them uh, at, at least we can lead by example. Thanks. Thanks, Jim and, and Michelle and Annette for, for that uh, response. So um, um, I've got a, a, a question from Susie Bailey, um, and this may or may not uh, be a question for uh, the core, the Jacksonville district if they're on, but uh, just a heads up. So um, Susie lives in Fort Lauderdale and appreciates being invited to these meetings. Um, uh, she was uh, saying that the Army Corps of Engineers had a meeting a few weeks ago in Fort Lauderdale, but the public wasn't invited um, and is asking if there will be another meeting in Fort Lauderdale soon and how residents might be included. Um, so that might be reference to uh, maybe it's the Army Corps 216 study. Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, which meeting that might have been, but um, I don't know if Tim or others uh, on the call might be able to speak to the engagement process with that. Um, Christian, this is Abby. I think she might be referring to the um, the Everglades conference um, and the the briefing that you all did to the mayor and the ASA um, on I think that was January twenty seventh. Over. It was just a few weeks ago, ahead. actually. What was it? I'm sorry. It was just a few weeks ago. It was yeah, in Lauderdale. It might have been a 216. Uh, yeah, it no. sounds like 
It sounds like a 216 study, Jim. Yeah, so I mean, we will certainly pass on the concern that the it, it would be strange that the public doesn't have some way of being involved. Uh, that's certainly not the way we work here or with our core partners here. So, um, but if you can, uh, uh, Susie, if you can give us any more information, we'll pass it on. As to, as to the meeting we had with the Assistant Secretary at the uh, Everglades Coalition meeting, uh, that was a, a small one-on-one -on -one meeting between the two of them and their aides, and it was just to uh, touch base uh, on some of the things that we're talking about today. Um, it's very important that those two officials stay in close coordination. Uh, that's going to make the August meeting uh, go much better, and uh, the subsequent decisions uh, that we'll have to make in the Part B, uh, Phase Two of this. What's next? Thanks, Jim. Um, Susie also had a question about where we can find the latest seawall height recommendations. Um, uh, good question. I think there are different, um, like the city of Miami has an ordinance for their seawalls. Is San Yan? Uh, I don't hear, I didn't want to, because, and then, and then I think the uh, county has sea, uh, seawall. Um, we can get that information. I think it's in the building code uh, area. Anybody on the on the team here want to add on to that? So Jim, I've just asked a clear clarifying question. Is that for the existing seawalls within the community or are they looking at the recommended plan in terms of the height of the structures? Good. Um, the question, can I, is, is it okay? Please. Yes, yes. Go ahead. I didn't want to interrupt. Um, yeah, it just we we were hearing four, but then I've attended your meetings and some meetings at other cities, and in it seems like there's been adjustments in sea level height recommendations. Um, you know, the the 50 year of maybe five, um, but you know, it seems like Miami seems to be going at five more than four on yeah. existing sea level. I think these are existing seawalls or new seawalls or existing ones under redevelopment, and these are the code provisions that apply to them. So what we are talking about in general high-level terms is structures are, are more than the seawalls. So, but we can still get you the information, Susie. <laughs> Thanks, Susie. And um, if you have a, another comment um, about, uh, I think this is from Juan about um, who live at 20 feet above sea level close to where the, the gates go. Um, I think this is uh, down near Coral Gables waterway. So placing the gates at Lejeune would increase flood levels east of the gate. Properties east of the gate would be severely impacted and these are the higher property values. Uh, you can build a gate further east of Lejeune, but it would still not protect those east of it. Um, and I uh, suggest you can't penalize some benefit, some to benefit others whose property values um, are lower. So yeah, thanks Juan for um, that, that comment about where the gates um, should should be considered for uh, those canals um, and, and, and how we can most fairly implement those. Uh, we really appreciate that, that comment. Um, I see a, a question from Silvio. Um, he asks, uh, possible to see the resources of research that have been compiled? Um, I'm not sure, if, Silvio, if you're referring to um, particular resources or research, maybe from the, the November charrette. Um, but we have a lot of that information summarized on the Army Corps study website uh, for this, um, and where you can learn more about that. But if there's something specific um, that you're hoping to learn from, uh, please reach out and we can try to find the, the original source of that. Thanks, Silvio. Um, uh, a question from Caroline Lewis. I think this is in reference to the non-structural um, measures. Uh, uh, she asked, how many feet do you elevate? Yeah, the buildings that are set to be elevated under the plan, the houses, the buildings. How high do we elevate these buildings? These structures. Oh, absolutely. Jim, right. I can take that one. So it, this is... This is a not helpful answer. It depends. So it would, uh, when we look at the location of the structure, it would depend on our design height and the difference between the height 
that design height and the um, topography in that area. So it could vary per structure when we're looking at non-structural. Uh, I can appreciate that. But could you give me a, typically it's more than two feet, but no more than six feet, something like that? Well, I, I don't have a not more than, but I would say that just in terms of cost, we like to look uh, at differences such as, you know, beyond one foot, uh, probably beyond two, because it's very expensive to elevate a structure. Uh, so we really have to get to a point where we're um, getting that cost benefit analysis for that structure. So it makes sense to elevate that structure. So we do try to look at um, elevating more than uh, one to two feet. Yeah, I guess my question is, is a race against time. I mean, we're buying time to stay here as long as possible and as safely as possible. But if we're predicting two feet by X amount, 2050, 2060, then we're saying that that's a lifetime we're planning for, right? Yes, we do plan for a 50 year economic life uh, for the project. So you're going to 2070 then? All right. That would, okay. yeah. yeah, I won't be here, but I hear you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. Uh, and we have Roderick asks, uh, does this alternative get the older buildings in FEMA flood zones certified as compliant for the National Flood Insurance Program? So I will, I will mention, I'll start first, and then if anyone else wants to add, when we um, formulate for a uh, a project, we're looking at maximizing net benefits. So that's the difference between the benefits and the cost. And it does not always um, align with the National Flood Insurance Program. So when we look at um, where we are maximizing that benefits, we do include the 100 year floodplain when we're looking at that. Uh, but when we formulate those measures, it may or may not uh, provide that certification for a National Flood Insurance Program. Yeah, I would just say at this juncture that the um, elevation uh, issue, especially, is one that we're going to look at uh, all the way through this part, first part to August and afterwards, because if we engage at a large scale in that exercise, that has to be a, a community led exercise. We can't do this single family house by single family house without looking at the adjacent public infrastructure, the road, and the utilities. So, uh, that's not where we're at right now. We're just trying to be able to do comparable uh, evaluations. Uh, but as we move forward, we're going to get have to get to that point because that I think our partners at City of Miami Beach have learned that they have a lot to share with us about how that works and doesn't work. So uh, that community level, uh, which the core program isn't there to raise our roads. So that means we've got to be making uh, investments in a coordinated way uh, at the neighborhood level. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and Aida, hi Aida. Aida asks, uh, when will the possible nature-based solutions become proposed nature-based solutions? Question on timeline here. So Jim, I'll jump in there. Certainly we're, we're looking at the alternatives and working to refine them. We will pro provide the alternatives uh, to the Assistant Secretary uh, of, of the Army for Civil Works. And then pending his approval in August, we will move forward into that part two of the feasibility study. And we will have to go through that process. Um, we will look to refine those measures. We will uh, improve the design and that will help us uh, work towards a draft report and then a final report. And that final report helps us, um, it's a, for our chief of engineers, that report is necessary to be coordinated through Congress so that we can get congressional authorization. And once we have congressional authorization, we can sign a design agreement with Miami-Dade County, which allows us to go into what's uh, called pre-construction engineering and design, which will allow us to further develop the design. In general, the feasibility study level design is 10% or maybe a little more, uh, but uh, we further that design in PED. And then as we uh, are able to um, submit our first contract, 
then we can move into what's called, um, we can, I'm sorry, we can move into construction. And at that point we would sign what's called a project partnership agreement, move into construction. It still considers, uh, still includes some additional design, but then we can work into construction of the features as we've identified the priority of, of the phasing at that point. And then certainly uh, at some point they'll be you know, constructed and on the ground. That's, as you can imagine, that's a multi-year process. It's certainly moving through the feasibility study uh, is we're looking at additional four years right now, and then certainly moving um, after authorization, then we have to get into the federal budget to get funding to move into design. So definitely a few years in the process before we can um, first identify the recommended plan for congressional authorization and then um, after that, move into design and construction. Um, thank, thank you, Michelle. I, I, I as a follow up to that, sorry, Jim. My question was more related to in the previous plan, in the 2020 plan, you had um, definite in Cutler Bay, you had the definite nature bay solution uh, proposed and planned. Um, but now in this new study, you have these as potential. So will the con at the conclusion of this part of the study, will those potential be planned? And then I know that they, they need to go through the whole construction process, but when will you know if they're possible or not possible? No, absolutely. That's a great question. I apologize for, for running through that. So when we start the feasibility study, we will uh, develop the tentatively selected plan. And so that will um, continue to refine the different measures that are included. And then we will present that tentatively selected plan as a milestone. Um, certainly check in, uh, we'll continue to work very closely with Miami-Dade County, uh, but it's that that's an opportunity also for them to say whether they you know, agree with the path forward that we've identified, uh, but that's when um, the measures that are proposed uh, transition into a tentatively selected plan. In the, and that's in the plan, you, okay. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, got it, we, that's, that's what I wanted to hear, yes, a tentatively selected plan. Yeah, but yes, let me is. add though, look, we don't have to wait and for the whole process to happen to, to go ahead as, as a community and do some uh, proceed with some of these structures. I know in, uh, either of you are involved with the cities and others, and we're designing one. Oh, right? uh, oh absolutely. Yeah, I, so look, yeah. we are going to learn from that. We're going to share that with the core. Uh, our, our partners, you know, as I said earlier, we stay in touch with all the communities who are doing these. And in Charleston, they're actually negotiating a design agreement uh, with the core where they take over some of those. Uh, these would be in, in the acronym PED, uh, and they're done locally. So uh, we have a lot to explore in this area because I think we're already leaders and we yeah. are going to take that and move that along because it's important to partner on this study because we get to the cost share. But if the cost share weren't there and we had resources from another funder, we'd, we'd move right ahead as you could if you got you know funding from some of the other grant programs. So I, here's an area where I think we will uh, leverage everything, our knowledge and our experience from the, what the cities are leading us on uh, in doing the infrastructure at the parks and other places. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Aida, great question. Uh, our next question is from Rose. I think we touched on this a little bit in our response to Delaney's question about how we're addressing sea level rise, but Rose asks, do these plans account for any groundwater coming up from our underground aquifers? Uh. So that, yeah, so Jim, <laughs> that's a great question. I think certainly we would need uh, additional input and definitely additional resources uh, to help us frame what that risk looks like. Uh, because one of the things that we'll have to do is when we, uh, even on that outer Atlantic barrier, when we're cutting off the ability of the water to get out, right, we're, we're cutting off the ability to drain off, we have to provide the opportunity for to absorb uh, the precipitation. So that would be something that may uh, certainly play into uh, the design and the, the pumping, the pump stations that might be necessary for that outer barrier. Thanks, Michelle. 
Uh, and then we have a question from Anissa. Anissa um, has been looking up storm surge gates. She's been doing her research. She says she did not see any storm surge gates online that could be opened and closed very well. How are storm surge gates constructed to open and close? She says she likes the idea of the island surge gates that open and close, but she wonders how wide they are when they are closed and how tall, if the water could be transferred to another location via a drain in an emergency situation, it could protect the gates from water pressure. So, <laughs> I want Michelle, get ready to give the technical answer, but here's my, look, the gates may not close for they only close if, if we're being threatened by a, a catastrophic storm surge. That's a determination that is made today every time we uh, have a hurricane uh, by the uh, Hurricane Center. And, and it's their calculations that tell us um, how, that, how the storm is coming in on us, what angle, what to expect in terms of both wind and storm surge. Storm surge being very important to them, and they're doing a lot of work. Today in our community, we have a, a, a structure called the uh, port tunnel that um, operates that same way. The tunnel is open 24 seven, uh, but if the, uh, the director of the hurricane center tells the captain of the port that that situation is, is uh, uh, the circumstances are happening, then the gates on that tunnel close and that protects that tunnel while the storm surge passes over that area. And then once they're all clear, the port opens it. So that's a different set of facts, but it's, to me, uh, shows you that these are, these are actions that, especially with storm surge, you know, we're gonna have 72 hour warning. So these gates don't just have to go in the next hour or two and then they're going to be able to open now the how that happens in the engineering I, i'll leave that to michelle but I, it's important to know that's when the gates close and that's how much time we have to know how to uh, make the operation go ahead michelle no i think you bring up some really great questions and some challenges certainly for gates and as jim mentioned they would be closed uh, infrequently in preparation for storms so i think it really highlights the need for operations and maintenance and the necess um, necessity of uh, you know yearly operating those gates and making sure that they are functional uh, not just before a storm because certainly there's never enough time before a storm they would have to be operated uh, in uh, before the storm in a kind of an operation and maintenance standpoint where um, they would also be inspected. So uh, definitely keeping up with the operations and maintenance would make sure that they are um, prepared when a storm does come in and that would have to occur annually. But you're definitely bringing up some good points. I think those are also challenges with um, when you see the covers for outlets, um, stormwater outlets where they have the flap gates, um, to prevent uh, you know, water from going backwards into those outlets, they can be, you know, get trashed and they can get clogged and they have challenges of getting closed. So certainly something to be keeping in mind in terms of operations and maintenance on those gates. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Thanks, Michelle. Yep, uh, we've got a, a question from Sanen about our coral reefs. So um, Sanen says that you know, artificial reefs have been mentioned in the plan, but he's curious about um, what we can do to reinforce existing coral reefs um, to uh, increase that protection. And then kind of a follow-up question about that is, how do we ensure that the, the sand expansion or the renourishment on the beach won't negatively impact those natural coral reefs? Well, I, I know that the state of Florida and our local folks both uh, in county government and our universities and our not-for-profits are all focused on, on reefs. And you know, I, I'm not sure we will have the time now to, to go into that detail, but I know that it, we, the county, are gonna be supportive of those efforts. Um, the, the existing beach renourishment study that was just authorized, I think uh, has some pilot projects that also deal in this area. 
uh, our Durham partners are the are the uh, county uh, working with the cities along the beach that work uh, very closely with the Jacksonville district. Uh, they are all experts uh, and they know when, how to place the sand. We've been placing sand on the beach ever since uh, 2018 because we also got awarded money from the disaster bill uh, to use to do that. So uh, does it always, maybe there's some, uh, you know, perfect is what we're after. There may be some situations where um, unintended consequences, but that's very closely monitored. And if we move from where we are today, and this is important to say, we're not going to propose something that jeopardizes the existing authorized project with all of its access and its dune preservation and uh, what we do have now. That's that would be foolish. We have a win in the in the, uh, and we are going to build on that and not do anything negative to it. So we're good question. Uh, I definitely will say that we can get you additional information by going to our our subject matter experts on reefs and the beach. Anything, Michelle, or anyone else from our technical team? So, Jim, I was just going to add, this sounds very much like those multiple lines of defense as we're looking at it. I would just say that some of those lines of defense fall within different buckets, and something like this would probably fall into something that maybe the community could look at, uh, but would not fall within the this project area that we're evaluating right now. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we have a, a question from Maria um, about uh, rainfall, flooding, and permeable pavement. Um, she says, as it relates to increasing permeable ground surfaces in an effort to absorb stormwater, have you considered the idea of replacing all concrete sidewalks, even within residential neighborhoods, with boardwalks or other perme permeable pavement solutions? Uh -huh. Well, I don't think it would be within the scope of the study we're talking about, but it's certainly within the scope of the of our municipal governments and of the county to to pilot some of these alternative ways. Uh, you know, our streets are a major conveyance system for our stormwater, and the sidewalks, you know, are, and how that all inter, interplays is important. So, I'm I'm just assuming that our experts in the cities. Uh, and the you know the county's so big. What what is going to make sense for one of our barrier island cities is not what you know you you probably deploy in Doral. So we're going to have different solutions. But I think many of our communities are sensitive to this stormwater issue, uh, and are going to be looking and exploring different things. It's probably would be beyond the scope though of this study. Is that right, Michelle? I would agree. Yes, Jim. Jim, it's Irela. I'll jump in real quick just to let folks know that the county is currently drafting um, some policy changes to our code with regards to permeable pavement coming soon. So stay tuned to the Biscayne Bay Watershed Management Advisory Board. Thank you, Irela. That's why we're lucky to have you. Who's next? Thanks, uh, everybody. We've got a question from Elizabeth asking if the recording of the meeting will be available to attendees, um, and I, I think that's in the intention, if I'm not mistaken, is that right, uh, Jim and Michelle? Yeah, I believe yeah. so. I think that's been, a, that was the last public meeting was posted online. I think this one will be as well, correct? Yes, and we'll be emailing out um, an email to everyone who registered with a link to the presentation slides, as well as a link to the video. Thanks. Okay. Um, it looks like uh, we've got a comment from Noel um, about how the high ground is important for planning for sea level rise as well as storm surge. Um, uh, the plans that are under consideration are focused on 100 year storm events, but the encroachment of saltwater intrusion of sea level rise needs a different approach. Um, I think we touched a little bit on sort of our, our other efforts for sea level rise adaptation to our sea level rise strategy. Um, and I know uh, this study is incorporating that uh, sea level rise as part of the storm surge modeling effort, but uh, it's a great point. I don't know if others wanna add on to, to Noel's comment or respond to that. 
Anything else? That's a good re response. Okay, and then we've got a question from uh, Dagmar. It says, all those sea level rise and storm surge are very important issues that the county needs to address. I would like to know if there are environmental plans. Um, I'm assuming that might have to do with like environmental restoration. Um, maybe you can touch on that. Well, there's a host of uh, really positive programs going on in the entire county by multiple levels of government and volunteers. So just speaking for the county, our eel program, our endangered lands program on, in Durham uh, uh, is a great example. And you, we can get uh, post links on that. Our, our county parks program is a leader uh, in the area, uh, in the same area. Um, so the environmental programs, and I, I'm, I'm not gonna even attempt to summarize for all the cities because they're all doing something. And then we're blessed with two national parks several state parks, uh, tribal lands, lands managed by the Water Management District. You know, you know it's a rare opportunity to, to, but we have to be good stewards of the, those green spaces. Plenty of uh, uh, things we could share on this and I will try to get them online so you can see them and we can give you people to talk to directly in those. Uh, and then there are foundations that do this work and not-for-profits that do the work. Um, rich tapestry of folks. Thanks, Jim. Um, next question in the chat is um, from Silvio. He asks if we can get a baseline of our natural capital assets and understand what the economic and environmental for nature-based solutions could be. For example, a nature-based solution becomes bigger and stronger over time and could create economic service engines that can fund its own operations and maintenance from carbon credits and other environmental credits to sustain locals for operations and maintenance. Could these economic analyses be considered versus built? Well, I know we, we have an economic study of Biscayne Bay underway, a relic can add to that, and that may be a starting point for some of what the questioner wants us to get into. Can you give us a status on that, Aurelic? Yes, in fact, it's well underway and we should have um, a final report this sometime in October of this year. And it's a partnership between the Water Management District to update the 2005 economic study for Biscayne Bay. This economic study will include also property values, which the past one did not. So expect a very robust economic numbers coming out of this one. I think my sense is the question is going to be even further than that. And uh, probably in the context of this call on this project, we, we don't have all the resource people we should have. But if you want to contact our office, we'd like to explore further with you what how we might be able to move that, uh, some of the questions you had. Thanks, Silvio, great question. Uh, and now we have a question from Merrick. Um, they ask about seawall development. Uh, Merrick is wondering for the construction of seawalls, can the materials be recycled organic matter such as driftwood and or use recycled matter such as washed up iron or metal pipes. And they were thinking that if we could use it to help keep a sustainable way for creating the seawall, uh, as well as helping keep our oceans clean by getting large amounts of materials found within the oceans. So Jim, I'll jump on that one. I would just say that in the design, we would, uh, certainly design the materials for, that could withstand the forces that would be applied on them, I would believe that would not include recycled material, but um, we would look at, I know that there was, I believe during the last public meeting um, or the last year, there was a discussion or, or a question about um, uh, carbon um, concrete. And I think that maybe have been about um, the type of 
how the concrete is developed. I know that the administration is uh, interested in, in certainly our carbon footprint and how we develop that. Um, but we would look certainly at um, you know, trying to maintain, maintain costs, making sure that the uh, construction is fe engineeringly feasible and will withstand certainly the design load. Um, but I, I'll just mention, I, I don't believe that it would include the recycled material. Yeah, and you're, I think Michelle's describing the kinds of measures that would happen if we were to implement them to protect us from storm surge. A typical seawall today is not built for that purpose. So, and there's a code requirement in each city and, and the county. So that's where, if there's another practical way to do it, that, that could meet those code requirements, that would have to be investigated uh, at that level. And we'd be glad to help you you know, talk to the folks that are in charge of these seawalls as they're currently developed and used in, in the cities and county. Thanks. Our next question in the chat is from John. He asks if there's a centralized location that provides all the current plans, and projects being reviewed, planned, and implemented to address the impacts of climate change and global warming. John, we have a great website. It's miamidade.gov slash resilience. Uh, all of our plans for addressing climate change uh, live there on that page. We have our sea level rise strategy, our climate action strategy, and tons of links to um, individual projects and more information. So definitely check out uh, the Office of Resilience's website. We can put a link to that in the chat for you as well. John may be thinking too of the additional plans that are undertaken by many other entities. And uh, I think that's something that we're aware of. I mean, it goes to this point of coordinating the projects and uh, we'll continue to look to see how we can make sure folks uh, that are interested can find this information on, one, when, on either our website or, or linked websites. Um, thank you. This um, uh, the next question here is uh, if the gate to prevent storm surge was sliding and remote that could be stored and hidden like a garage door that opens and closes horizontally, it would be a new design that no cities have. Does the city have green walls or green roofs or rainwater collection in the plants collect water that adds to storm surge? What? I think the first part of the question maybe to was to explore all forms of structural gates. Is that how you interpret it, Michelle? I, I believe so. And I'll just mention, Jim, that in the city of Norfolk, uh, we have uh, some, some gates within our flood wall that are hidden, that they are operated when there is, you know, when they have their annual uh, operation and then certainly in uh, anticipation of a storm. So they are hidden within the wall. They'll come out and close as necessary and then go back within the wall um, when they're not needed because they cross over say um, uh, roadways and um, you know they need to be stored in the meantime. So that's possible. Uh, and certainly something like you're mentioning, we can evaluate uh, different options for the gates, but uh, certainly want to make sure that they're, op, you know, can be operated uh, as needed and um, meet the the type of storm surge that we would be uh, experiencing within Miami-Dade County. And I think the green roofs and the other um, measures, the sort of the second part of the question are, are very relevant and important. They're probably not going to be the subject matter of this study, but I think the cities and the county are all exploring some of them. And if, if we can help you identify which ones are there, or you can help us with examples, uh, we welcome that. But I don't think those will, will fall within the scope of the things Michelle was talking about. I'd agree. Thank you, Jim. All right, thank you so much. The next question we have here is, would it make sense to require waterproof doors? Some homes and hotels are built underwater and if sea level or happens, it might be good to build waterproof downstairs and escape route to the roof. That may be in our future. It's something I think we're, you know, constantly being looked at. 
Um, you know, building codes are minimum standards. Uh, you'll see buildings get designed, I think, in the future that are going to go beyond them and uh, uh, put in place um, measures that they'll in turn advertise and say, these are safer buildings because we expended these additional steps. Uh, so I expect to, I personally expect to see that happening in some of the, and, and we live in a community that is constantly redeveloping, right? It's that new development or major redevelopment of an existing site is happening. And that, that's the very opportunity to explore those new options. Uh, Jim, the best Jim, thing to I... do then with the new ideas is to then incorporate them into the code where they can be, uh, uh, where they can be applied across the board but we'll be thinking about the cost uh, to the average homeowner. Go ahead, Michelle. I apologize for cutting you off. I think what I was going to add is, I think um, the question really prompts concern. And one thing that we wanna reiterate is that when we flood proof or we provide structural measures to reduce risk, it really is to reduce damage and not life safety. So we would still want to emphasize that people evacuate uh, during a storm and not stay in an elevated structure and not stay behind a barrier. And the reason why we say this is if um, if something were to fail, if you were to have a an emergency, a medical emergency, or if the structure were to catch on fire, um, you know, rescue could not get to you during that time, during that storm event. So remember to, uh, we always wanna emphasize that again, these measures are to reduce property damage, um, but they are not for life safety. So we highly recommend that people evacuate in preparation for a storm. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, the next question here is, can the Corps, uh, can the Army Corps please explain why the problems, opportunities, objectives and constraints document has changed? Specifically, the document that was shared in the interagency meeting in December removes inclusion of NNBFs, na uh, natural and nature-based features, from the objectives column. Yet, the original document on the US ACE website still has it as an objective. I thank the Corps and the county for having explained this change to me earlier, but it's helpful to relate this change for the public for the sake of transparency. Thanks, and thanks for staying late in the day. So Jim, I'll, I'll jump in and say that um, you know, including natural and nature-based features are still uh, an objective, if I understood that uh, question correctly, is still an objective for this study moving forward. And, and I'll just mention also is that when we've looked at the problems opportunities, you know, problems of opportunities, objectives and constraints back in November, we wanted to revisit them, the ones that were identified in the November, uh, in the original feasibility study and provide opportunity to provide additional input uh, to refine. Since we recommended a plan that was not supported by the county, we wanted to provide additional opportunity to maybe uh, refine them or include additional um, uh, text, uh, but moving forward into the new alternatives, natural nature-based features inclusion is uh, one of the um, objectives of the study moving forward. I'll pause and see if Justine, if you wanted to add anything. Hi, Michelle, thank you. Um, I think what Audrey is referring to, um, what we had um, conveyed previously is that we, we <laughs> while that is overall an objective and we are looking for ways to incorporate NNBF, um, we couldn't have an objective uh, that has a measure in it. So I think we had uh, previously removed uh, that measure uh, incorporating more NNBF um, from the objectives column <laughs> and over to the opportunities column. Thank you, Justine, for okay. clarifying that. 
Mm-hmm. Great, thank you so much, Michelle and uh, Justine. Uh, the next question we have here is: uh, Many islands uh, were man-made around South Florida. Do you so? Do you see building islands as a way to minimize storm surge or flooding? Do you plan on building more islands offshore with mangroves? I got so caught. I'll, I'll yep, go, ahead, Jim. <laughs> go ahead. Do you have an answer? I was just going to say it was uh, brought up during the charrette for the spoil islands and certainly as an opportunity for natural and nature based features. I, I think as we move forward and look at um, the constructability of the natural nature based features, I think that will shape and um, design what those features look like and and where they will be located, whether they are located on, on the spoil islands or along the shoreline. Um, also just kind of reiterate that when we're looking at those, um, again, we're looking at that opportunity to reduce uh, coastal storm surge and that damage. And so looking uh, to locate those where they could reduce that damage to adjacent properties, um, certainly if when we look at that, it would be a system and we want to make sure that, again that that's lowering the uh, surface water, water surface elevation to reduce that damage. And then I think that's another, we're in another situation where there's a specific way we look at mangroves in the context of this study. And then there's our broader community interest in seeing how we can protect our existing mangroves and expand on it because we get so many multiple benefits uh, from carbon sequestration to uh, you know, uh, marine ha habitat. Uh, and so there's an ongoing effort in many places to, to look at uh, mangroves, uh, expanding them in appropriate places. Great, thank you. And uh, this next question is in the same vein. Uh, uh, it reads, it's my understanding that the current legal policy doesn't enable us to plant more mangroves. Is there any way the community can get policy and head start on planting more mangroves for resilience purposes? Um, Jim, this is Irela. I Go ahead, Irela. I shared some legislation that is currently at the state level that was filed, SB 100, and it was inspired by the work of the Biscayne Bay Task Force. So I encourage you all to take a look at that. A, an important element of looking at, at where what happens to mangroves is their ownership. You know, are they owned privately or by a public entity? Uh, and then there are um, laws and regulations that do apply. Um, but that's probably something we should follow up with you on. If you can connect with us, we'll try to go in depth. I, uh, monitors, how are we doing? We're at 7.30. What are we looking at? Uh, One more uh, question in the chat, Jim. Oh, oh, take that chat question. So the, the last question we have in the chat is, uh, what is the process for proposing nature-based solution pilot projects with the county? Well, as it pertains to this project that we're talking to you tonight about with the Corps, um, please use the different uh, pathways that we talked to you about earlier, um, the online tool, uh, sending us the information, uh, getting uh, to the charrette and bringing that there. Now, the county's interested in some, anything like you, I think you're uh, thinking about, it may not fit in this particular pathway of working in the core, but we'll be glad to explore that uh, as a pilot in some other way, uh, if there's a, a practical, feasible way to do it. And, and Jim, to your earlier point about the city's leading, I shared some links to some of the work that the city of Miami and the city of Miami Beach has done with the Nature Conservancy as pilot projects and examples of what can be done, maybe in a larger scale in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rel. So we're going to be starting to lose some of our technical support here. Um, is uh, now we're open. We've done the chats. 
Do we have some hands up that are uh, critical? Um, I, I can commit to you and time-wise, probably we're gonna be a little sharper after uh, in responding and be able to handle your question. And so you wanna uh, use our um, re resilience at miamiday.gov. Uh, we'll take them that way. But is there some, the you who have patiently waited that raise your hand, we're here. There are currently no hands raised. Well, appreciate that on everybody, because uh, I know this is a, a set of issues of interest to our entire community and that the demonstrated by the people who uh, signed on today. Uh, so we gave and shared a lot of information. We got a good feedback. Uh, it will affect what goes on. It already has the past uh, sessions the Zoom call and the charrette. So uh, stay involved. Uh, if you're in a city, get involved with your city work, get involved with an, uh, an NGO, a, uh, an not for profit organization or your neighborhood group. Uh, and if you're just still looking for a way to get involved, get, get a hold of us uh, and we'll find a way to connect. We need everybody uh, on this, on this uh, set of issues that we're dealing with. Michelle, would you like to say anything uh, as we uh, wrap up? No, absolutely, Jim. Thank you so much. And I just wanted to thank everybody for their participation today. Your input definitely makes a difference. We greatly appreciate it. Please uh, use those tools that are available for making comments. Please, if there is somewhere you'd like to recommend for a natural nature-based feature, please you know, highlight that in the comment tool. We, we greatly appreciate the input. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, everyone, uh, the support staff from the county and the court that was here, consultants, um, and everyone else participated. We're going to be signing off for the evening. Be safe, stay well, and stay involved. Thank you.